Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Emma Katz. For anyone who is new, welcome to Neely. Neely is the Women's Initiative of the YU Tor Mitzion Kolel in Chicago. And I am very lucky to be the, um, I don't know, what's my title today? I'm the director of Neely. And I'm very, very excited to have you all here this evening. This evening is sponsored by the Shirley Rothner Taras Mishbacha um, Initiative, which is a portion of Neely, which focuses on the Neely Taras Mishbacha Hotline. The hotline is a resource that was created for the Chicago community in which our five, we, until recently we had four amazing college teachers and this year we added on a fifth incredible college teacher, are there to anonymously answer your questions in areas of mikvah, nida, taras, and mishpacha in a way that you're comfortable. You can either call, text, email, submit an anonymous web form. All of these forms are completely anonymous. You will be in touch with one of our amazing college teachers. They speak to a Rav and they relay that back the answer to you within 12 hours. This is a non-emergency service, but an incredible resource for the community nonetheless. This evening, we are so excited to present a conversation on contraceptive contraception options. So often there are questions of, I'm in this situation, what can I use for birth control for this stage of life, for that stage of life? I need something that helps me in this way and not that way. And tonight we are here to have that conversation between two amazing women. Hosting this evening will be Dr. Nechama Brand. Dr. Nechama Brand. Let me pull up the very official bio. Dr. Nicole Brand was trained as a Kala teacher by Daughters of Israel. She has been teaching Kala since 2010 and during that time has also guided women with questions in the realm of Taras Mishbacha. Nechama is originally from Miami, Florida. Nechama studied at Stern College before earning her DMD from New Jersey Dental School and she currently practices dentistry at Premier Dentistry at Millennium Park. Nechama lives in Skokie with her husband, Rabbi Ruvain Brand, the Rosh Kolal of the YU Torah Mitzion Kolal, and their five children. Nechama is one of the college teachers on our hotline and a great friend, and I'm so excited to see Nechama on the screen. Nechama will be hosting this evening, and she will introduce Dr. Hellman, who we are so excited to virtually welcome to the Chicago community. Um, and just before I turn it over to Nechama, just a reminder that at the bottom of your screen, there is a question and answer option. Throughout tonight's program, you can submit questions. We will have time for question and answer at the end. Please remember, if you would like your question to be anonymous, to check the button that says submit anonymously. And at the end, we will have time for the questions and answers. Um, so please feel free to write in throughout, but we will not stop till the end of the program. And with no further ado, I turn it over to you, Nahama, to introduce Dr. Hellman. Thanks so much, Emma. Welcome to everyone here tonight, and thank you so much for joining. We at Neely are so honored to host this event and to be joined by the amazing Dr. Hellman tonight, who I'll introduce in just a minute. Um, I wanted to take a moment just to put tonight's talk in the appropriate context. When we speak about contraception, we need to see it in the proper light, which is a valid and in some cases very healthy halachic option when it is necessary and appropriate. Um, it's crucial for us to realize that there is a very important mitzvah in the Torah to have children. It is referred to as a mitzvah rabbah, one of the most important mitzvot that we have. Um, it actually is the very first mitzvah in the Torah, pru uravu, to be fruitful and to multiply. And there are three partners in the creation of a child. There's the mother, the father, and Hashem, okay? And therefore, all three need to be consulted before making a decision about whether to have a child or not. Since we don't understand all the intricacies of Hashem's Torah, we turn to those who know the Torah best, to our rabbis, when we are looking for that third part, which is Hashem's decision about us having a child or not, okay? We are asking the rabbis for their guidance to help us understand what the halacha says in specific circumstances. So the question to have a child or not becomes a halachic question. There are many conflicting factors in a person's life that would warrant to hold off having children, whether that would be health issues, mental health issues, financial issues. These are all crucial um, aspects and factors in that decision. 
Um, it's important to understand that there are different types of contraceptives that Dr. Hellman is going to um, describe at length. Um, and different methods of birth control will be more halachically preferable to others that we will speak about as Dr. Hellman introduces the different options. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Dr. Lisa Hellman, and I'll read her bio. Dr. Hellman is an experienced board cer certified OBGYN. She received her medical degree from NYU School of Medicine and completed her residency at Northwell Health in Long Island in OBGYN. Dr. Hellman has been in clinical practice for over 11 years in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, not too far from us. She's also the phys physician at the Confident Kala, a telemedicine gynecology practice focused on the needs of Jewish women who observe Tara Semeshvacha. From a personal standpoint, I'll tell you that I have sent Kala's that I'm teaching to Dr. Hellman's telemedicine service and has been so helpful and such an incredible service. And I really highly recommend anyone who's looking to kind of, you know, take advantage of this program to reach out to Dr. Hellman. Uh, throughout her years as a clinician, she noticed a gap in women's health awareness and education. This developed into a social interest, in a, I'm sorry, into a special interest in patient education and being a resource for the Jewish community in relation to body awareness and women's preventative health starting from a young age. And I now introduce Dr. Hellman to give us the scientific and uh, medical portion of this presentation. Thank you so much, Nechama. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in um, because there is a lot to talk about and I want to make sure that we cover everything and, um, and get through it all and be able to answer questions. But thank you so much, everyone here at Neely, um, for having me. I really I love talking about this, as you'll see. Um, all right, I am going to share my screen. All right, does everyone see that? Is it okay? There we go. Okay, so um, the title of this talk, Contraception Options, Everything Birth Control, basically um, we're just going to talk about really just like a, an overview of what, are, what is out there, how they work, benefits, risks, little details here and there about them. Again, um, if something kind of sparks your interest and you're interested in it, definitely a good idea to, you know, talk to your doctor about it, um, get more information, see if it would be right for you. But this is just kind of like, hey, this is what's out there so that we all kind of are on the same page. All right, so just a little quick um, um, review. This is me. I am um, from Milwaukee, did all my training out in New York, like um, Nahama had said. Came back to Milwaukee where I live with my husband and three kids. I've been here for over 11 years, just doing like regular OBGYN, delivering babies, treating yeast infections, doing pap smears. Um, but then I also, uh, about a year and a half ago, started a telemedicine practice called the Confident Kala. And this is, I, I've really found that especially in conversations like the one we're going to have tonight, um, you know, from women are not educated and don't have the same opportunities to get the information and education um, that um, they need to know about at different times of their life. So I felt like opening this telemedicine practice really gives me the time to like sit and talk with um, an individual woman, talk about her individual needs. It's a lot different than just like making an appointment at your regular doctor, which can feel a little bit more rushed. So, and I also get it. Like I'm a firm woman myself. I know what Tahar's Samishbacha entails and it's not always easy and not always, um, easy when it comes to birth control, which we and um, Naham and I will be talking about towards the end. All right, so what are we really gonna talk about today? Um, you know, what's out there, right? Like, what are all the different categories of birth control? How do they work? What does that mean for you about how they work? And what are the side effects and the benefits of all of them and how that fits into you choosing one that fits best into your life. Um, and it's really, what I, what I found is that it's really easy to kind of think about birth control into three separate categories. You know, there's so many things out there and I can give you this huge list, but if you have started to think about how a birth control fits into your life based on your priorities and your needs, um, we can kind of, it, 
it kind of just helps us think about it in categories. So the first category, non-hormonal, right? This means there's no hormones. They're purely a contraceptive. Um, that's really all they do. Um, and these include things like being aware of your cycles, spermicide, diaphragm, the paraguard, copper, IUD, and barrier methods, progesterone only, which um, many people use throughout their lives, many people use at specific times in their lives, pills, um, a Depo-Provera shot, progesterone, and IUDs and Explanon, and then a combined hormonal method where we're talking about pills, vaginal rings, and a patch. And we're going to go into detail more about each one of these, um, but I think um, Nahama wanted to um, mention something first, kind of before we jump in. Yes, okay. So typically when we talk about contraception, the need to issue that we encounter with different contraceptions is usually contraceptives is going to be spotting or staining, okay? Um, so the question is, when does spotting or staining make us in Anita? So let's just do a really quick brief overview because I will tell you that if you ask probably any rabbi or any college teacher, the question of spotting and staining is probably the most asked Shaila or question in Nita Shaila's. And I think with a little bit of information, so many of these questions can really actually be avoided and we know the answers, you know, just by knowing the halachot. Um, okay, so when we talk about Nida, when we talk about Nida de Oraita, which means biblical Nida, essentially just, you know, this is a very brief overview for more details, please reach out to the hotline or your kala teacher or a rabbi or a rebetzin. Um, Nida de Oraita, from a biblical standpoint, what would basically make you in Nida would be your period or a flow, simplistically, okay? Um, so a flow or your period would make you in Nida from a biblical standpoint. There's then a second layer of Nida introduced by the rabbis, which is Nida Dirabanan, okay? And what the rabbis introduced was that if there were certain types of stains that a woman saw, they would then, if the stains met five specific criteria, then these stains can make a woman in Nida from a rabbinic standpoint. Now, as Orthodox Jews, we follow both a halacha from the Torah, biblical halacha, as well as the Rabbanan halacha. Um, so to make sure that we don't get into an issue of these stains becoming a nida problem, the rabbis created a situation where because they created the halacha, they also created the framework for the halacha, which means that all five of the following criteria need to be met for the stains to create a status of nida. So we're just going to very quickly go through what those five would be. If any one of these five is not met, then that stain does not make a lady in a woman in Nida. Okay. So the first um, criteria would be that the stain cannot be attributed to anything else. Sometimes a woman will be see a stain on her leg, on undergarments, on her, you know, on uh, pajamas or anywhere it might be. And if we can say that that stain possibly is from makeup, from a procedure, from um from shaving, from a cut, from paint, from hemorrhoids, from a difficult bowel movement. If we can find another reason that perhaps that stain or that blood or, you know, is there, we could possibly create a situation where this stain would not be attributed to Nida and would not be problematic. So in order for the stain to be a Nida, the first criteria that needs to be met is that it cannot be attributed to any other source. Okay, the second criteria that needs to be met to make a stain um, render someone a nida would be the size. The stain has to be larger than a gris, which is a bed bug, which is equivalent, we assume, to a U.S. penny. Um, the way this came about is that in the time of the Gamaras, bed bugs were rampant, as was the case when I lived in Manhattan a few years ago, okay, and um, people would go to sleep and wake up and there were, you know, marks from a dead bed bug on them. So what the rabbis created, what the Gemara created, is that in, in order for this to be attributed to a nida stain, we assume it has to be larger than the size of what a bed bug was back then, which is a U.S. penny. So even though we no longer might have bed bugs, we still keep this halacha, which means that if the stain is smaller than the size of a U.S. penny, then the stain is not problematic and we do not need to consider it something that would make us in need of, okay? The third criteria that needs to be met in order for a stain to make a woman a nida would be that it has to fall on white. The stain must appear on something white. Otherwise, we assume that we're not accurately seeing the color of the stain. So therefore, other than the Shiva Nikiyam, the seven clean days that we need to wear white underwear, every other day, every other 
day in our cycle, we should be sure or try not to wear white underwear, wear colored underwear. And this will ensure that this <coughs> category is not met. And again, if any one of these five categories is not met, then the stain will not make a woman in need of. The fourth category is that the stain must be a problematic color, okay? Typically red and black are problematic or questionable colors. White and yellow or any mucousy type of color would be an okay color. Browns and other colors are questionable. And that those would be questions that we would be we would bring in to ask. We're not gonna go into the whole um, idea of asking questions right now. All I like to say is that often ladies are very pleasantly surprised when they bring something in and ask. More often than not, I will say we get an answer that we're very happy with. So definitely something worthwhile to bring in when we aren't sure. Um, and then the last category that needs to be met in order for a stain to render a lady in Nida, it's a little bit of a, compl a complicated category. Um, it is that something, the stain must fall on a surface that is Mikabel Toma. This is based on the halachos of Tuma and Tahara from the Beis HaMegdash. But basically what it means is that the material that the stain falls on needs to be susceptible to Tuma and Tahara, to, to ritual purity, okay? So essentially what this means is natural fibers are mikabel Tuma. N um, any synthetic fibers are not mikabel Tuma, which leaves the room to say that any papers or toilet papers or possibly pads or panty liners, according to many rabbis, if a stain falls on those materials, it would not render a lady in need of. Very good thing to know, very good um, reason to ask a Shiloh, because if this category is not met and your rabbi does hold by this heter, which many, many rabbis do, then if you see a stain on toilet paper, if you see a stain on a panty liner, on a pad, it could be that that would not make you in need of. Um, because this is a machloget, the Chicago Mikva actually sells black panty liners so that you have you don't have the issue of the white as being a color, um, just to avoid that possibility on white. So again, the five criteria was it can't be attributed to anything else. The size has to be larger than a U.S. penny. It has to fall on white. It has to be a problematic color, and it needs to fall on a surface that is Mikabel Tuma. All five of those need to be met in order for a stain to render a lady in Nida. It is a good idea to get in the practice of not looking, of not seeing. We do say that the halachic reality occurs when you see the reality, okay? You can't do this with your period. You can't just not look at your period and say, oh, I'm not a nida because I didn't look. But for stains that would work, um, the reasoning behind that has to do with a hargasha, which is a more complicated discussion. But basically for the stains, if we don't see the reality, then the reality, so to speak, we don't need to look unless it is a time that we need to be doing a badika. Um, so I just want to finish this little, um, review by saying this applies only to stains that come out of our bodies, okay? If we insert something inside our bodies, like a tampon when we're not in need of for some reason, or a badika cloth that we insert inside our bodies, then any size stain and any stain on that cloth or something inserting inside of us would need to be evaluated and not you know, the size and the leniencies that we just discussed does not apply to something that's inserted inside of our bodies. And then just to close, the question many people ask when they go through staining is when does it qualify as a heavy stain or spotting versus a flow and a period? And this is the million dollar question that every Rav deals with and every Rav hears the question. And sometimes it's hard for us to even describe what exactly is going on. So there are a lot of different criteria that Rabbanim give. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what would qualify as a stain versus a flow. Some rabbis like to say it as it qualifies as when you would say a panty liner is no longer enough. I now need a pad. If you're going out of the house and you feel like you would need to put in a tampon, that would be a time that you would say it's no longer a stain, it's a flow. Some rabbis like to describe it as a stain that's larger than a folded dollar bill. So if you have a dollar bill folded in half and your stain is larger than that size, then that's a time that we would assume that we're moving from the category of stain to flow. Once we're in the category of flow, again, the five criteria we described no longer apply, then we are in you know, the need of a period or a flow type of situation. Um, and that's it. That, back to you, Dr. Hellman.
Okay, that was great. It's always good to have that review and to put that into context, which because we will definitely be um, talking about spotting and staining in this conversation. All right, so first, um, let's take that first category that I mentioned, the non-hormonal category. And remember, um, non-hormonal, right? We're not changing anything with your cycle at all. Um, hormones affect your cycle. Um, your cycle is is, is run by your own hormonal fluctuations throughout the month and um, hormonal birth control can change those fluctuations. Um, but since there's no hormones in the non-hormonal category, um, this maintains your usual cycle and it is purely a contraceptive. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is cycle awareness method. So I really like to start with this um, as a contraceptive option um, whenever I'm having a birth control discussion because I think people kind of forget about it. You know, like you don't have to be on anything to use contraception. And what you're using here is your own awareness of your body. Um, you are re being really careful about tracking your cycle length, so that you understand how long each one is, what your pattern is. And when you can figure out your pattern, you can figure out when you ovulate. Um, and ovulation is going to be your most fertile time in your cycle. Um, so if you know when you're fertile, you can either abstain from intercourse or use some form of contraception at that time, and that's how you are preventing pregnancy. So how do you do this? Um, you, again, your calendar is very important. You are tracking your cycle links. And for someone who's practicing the Hart HaMishvacha, right, it's something you're kind of naturally doing anyways with all the badikas that you have to do um, throughout the cycle and as you're getting closer to your next period. Um, you're also kind of being aware of physical changes in your body throughout the month. So some people will take a temperature every day in the morning. Um, some people will be um, very focused on what is their cervical mucus like um, because it can change consistency and color um, throughout or around ovulation time. Some people will also use ovulation detection kits, right? Where you can get these in any drugstore, Amazon, anywhere. Um, and if you want to be like a little more scientific about it, you pee on a little stick, like a pregnancy test, and it tells you if you um, are in that fertile time where you're just about to ovulate. Um, and you can also use spermicide when needed. So if you know, hey, I'm ovulating, especially if it's close to men the time when you know you very likely are going to have intercourse, then you may want to use spermicide at that time, but not feel like you have to use it as your cycle continues and you're getting close to your next period um, where you're not going to be fertile that week. Um, so the um, I guess the con of using this, any cycle awareness method, and there are um, a bunch, um, is that it what if your cycle is irregular, right? Um, what if you just kind of forgot to think about your mucus or do your temperature um, that over the, a couple of days here and there and you aren't, you didn't catch ovulation. So um, there are some people it works for beautifully, especially when you have a very regular cycle. And if you have an irregular cycle on your own, um, it can be a little bit more confusing. Um, so it's it takes a lot of thought. Um, most people who use it are really okay with it and it's not a big deal, but you have to kind of be committed to being aware and really focusing on where you're at with that or where you are in your cycle. All right. Um, and then, so I kind of mentioned using spermicide during, um, you know, in combination with cycle awareness methods. So what is that? Um, so there's two kind of the categories of ways to kill sperm, um, which is what spermicide is. And the main, um, I think what, what most people know about is regular spermicide that you can buy in the drugstore. Um, the active ingredient is called nanoxinol 9, which really just is poisonous to sperm. It kills them. Um, you can buy them in the, um, in the drugstore, you don't need a prescription. It comes in multiple forms. I think probably one of the most common ones that um, many women are familiar with is called VCF, which is a film. It gets inserted into the vagina. It comes in foam. It comes in a sponge. It comes in like creams and inserts and gels. Um, and these are um, things that you need to put inside the vagina at least 15 minutes before intercourse. Um, and it, they usually last for about an hour, like their effectiveness. And they basically kill the sperm that is ejaculated into the vagina during intercourse. And one dose of it 
works for one ejaculation. So if there is more than one, you would have to put another dose in. Um, they're about 80% effective. Um, and then there's a, another um, kind of newer kind of, and I don't really want to call it a spermicide because it's, it's not marketed as a spermicide, but it is, um, again, a gel called Fexi that you also insert into the vagina. It can be put in right before intercourse. There's a little less of a time constraint with this one, uh, but again, it only lasts for about an hour. And what this cream and gel, it's kind of like a gel cream, what it does is it acidifies the vagina. Sperm don't live very well in an acidic environment. Um, so it kind of indirectly kills them. It just puts them in a place that they don't like as opposed to being like actual poison like the more traditional spermicides. And this is um, a touch more effective. It's 86 to 93% effective. Um, it comes in this little that's black box here. It, there's about 12 doses in there. It's pretty expensive right now. I think a box is $250, um, but I'm sure you can get like discount cards with them, but at the end it's a prescription. So um, that that's just another option. And why would someone want that? They want to, um, you know, avoid using something with hormones. They've tried the more traditional spermicides and they're just, they can be irritating. And this is really the main side effect of spermicide is it can be irritating to the vaginal walls, which can cause some discomfort. Um, and why are they like in the kind of 80 percentage range of effectiveness? Because there's a lot of personal responsibility, right? It's important to place them with the right amount of time beforehand. Um, it's important to have them on hand when you're, you know, planning on having intercourse. Um, and so lots of those little variables may not always match up perfectly and happen every single time. So that is why we see a little bit less effectiveness than some other methods. All right, um, moving on to something called the Kaya diaphragm. This is a diaphragm that is um, kind of a, almost like a one size fits most. Um, it is um, prescription in America. You can actually just buy it on your own in some other countries. And what a diaphragm is, is it is a little um, kind of like silicone plastic disc, very flexible, that is put up inside the vagina and covers the cervix. Um, so the cervix um, needs to be completely covered and you also have to use these with spermicide. Um, so it comes with um, its own spermicide. You can use others with it, um, but um, they, you know, they kind of market it like, hey, buy our spermicide with it too. Um, you do need a prescription here and you, it's always a good idea to get it fitted. And what does that mean? That means you go to your gynecologist, you bring the diaphragm with you, you put it in, and then your gynecologist kind of feels around and checks to see that your entire cervix is covered, that there's no space, that the, the vaginal walls are really kind of holding the diaphragm in to cover the cervix, because that's the goal, right? This And during intercourse, that sperm can go up through your cervix, and we need to make sure that that cervix is blocked. Now, we will talk about some other barrier methods in a little bit, um, but why isn't this considered, at least in a halachic, you know, I guess, framework, and Nahami can jump in if you want, um, a barrier method? And the reason for that is because you also need to use spermicide with it. It's just the effectiveness of it goes way down, um, probably about 70, 65% effective um, when you don't use spermicide with it. So we know that some sperm, the tiny little cells can still kind of get in and around the diaphragm, but because there's also gonna, they're gonna be meeting some um, spermicide there. Um, it's, just, it's almost like there's two things there kind of preventing um, you know, sperm from getting inside the, um, inside the cervix. So Dr. And Dr. again, Dr. just for a second, yeah. um, like we talked about before, that contraception is a halachic question. Um, and then once, you know, we have the heter to use contraception, there are going to be more preferable methods than others. The most preferable methods are going to be methods that have no barrier or do not at all affect the natural intercourse. Okay. So there's no barrier. There's um, so that would be, for an example, birth control pills, any hormonal or chemical birth control that we can take that will change, not change the actual act of the intercourse or barrier to the intercourse, but rather change 
the, um, the cycle of the woman from a hormonal standpoint or from a chemical standpoint so that the actual act is not changed in any way. Um, that being said, there are circumstances that do not allow this or circumstances that a woman does not feel comfortable with this. And there are many, many exceptions to this. And there are many other methods that are used in halakhically acceptable ways. So if there's any reason that a woman feels that, you know, she does not want to be on a birth control pill, her doctor does not advise her to be a birth, on a birth control pill or an IUD or something that would more affect the woman's cycle rather than the act or something physical that we put, you know, between the husband and the wife, then definitely worthwhile to ask a Shiloh because um, there are always circumstances that allow for different heterium. Right. Okay, great. Um, just one more detail about the diaphragm is that it has to be placed about two hours before, you know, you're going to have sex and then it has to stay in for about six hours afterwards. So definitely more high maintenance and um, need a lot of like planning involved. Um, so just, um, just to kind of keep that in mind as well, that has to kind of fit in with your lifestyle and ability to remember. All right. And then um, the probably the most um, commonly non-hormonal method of birth control used, at least from the doctor's office, um, is something called the Paragard IUD. And you may have heard, um, heard it called as the copper IUD. Um, and you can actually see here on this picture that there is little bits of copper kind of wrapped around the arms of the IUD. Um, and it's a little T-shaped device. Um, it is inserted by your gynecologist in the doctor's office. Um, it is something Thing where you would, and we will talk about this even further when we talk about the other IUDs, but um, it usually is um, slightly uncomfortable, a little crampy, um, and it um, usually just some like ibuprofen or Tylenol should help with the discomfort, um, and it gets inserted um, into the uterine cavity. And you can see here on this model that it needs to fit in to, you know, the uterine cavity is like an inverted triangle and these T-shaped devices um, fit um, nicely into that. Um, this is not real life. Um, this IUD is kind of a little bit low because the uterus is a little small for it, but um, that's kind of how it would sit in. Now, what does how does it work for birth control? So the copper itself, we think, um, creates an inflammatory reaction within the lining of the uterus called the endometrium. And that is that area is extremely inhospitable to sperm. So sperm, yes, can get into the cervix, into the uterus, but then when it hits the uterus, it's it just kind of shrivels up, it goes away. Like these sperm do not like it. And fertilization usually happens in the fallopian tubes up here. So the sperm needs to kind of swim all the way up here, get into the fallopian tube and meet the egg. However, this is a very annoying place for the sperm to be. So they kind of go away or they, you know, die. They're fun. They don't really have great function anymore. Um, now, what does that inflammatory reaction do for you who has it in? Well, it can also make periods a little bit heavier. It can make them a little bit crampier and it can make them a little bit longer. So this is not really a great idea for someone who has really long, heavy periods to begin with. It's great for someone who does not want any hormones and has like a three, four day kind of light to meet medium flow period, because even if it does extend it, it's just like a day or two, um, and we're not um, really prolonging a cycle, um, especially when we're thinking about um, getting as clean as we can um, to start counting the Shavu Nikiyam. Um, so this can't, it's something that you need to kind of think about what your own cycle is before considering this one. Um, and I, all IUDs um, are about 99.2% effective, um, which is the most effective contraception that we have available. Um, so, um, and that is because it's a put it in and forget about it. There's no change in dosing. There, it's a constant effect. Um, it lasts, this one lasts for a long time, about 10 years. Again, can come out at any time. Um, if you, you know, if you would want to try and conceive again, um, it does not have any um, impact on your fertility at all. Once it's out, the effect is over and you should be able to get pregnant or the potential for pregnancy is there within the next month. Um, and um, the, really the main risk of this IUD being put in is um, what's called uterine perforation. When we put the IUD in, we can really only see our cervix. Um, and there's 
a chance that that IUD could like poke through all the way the um, through the uterus. That is a very, very, very rare occurrence. There's lots of measures that we take to avoid that um, in the office when we are inserting it. Um, I'm sure you would have probably heard of kind of horror stories of, oh, my IUD got embedded or it's it fell out of my uterus. And those are all things that definitely can happen. Um, nothing is perfect, but the chance of those happening are so, so minuscule. Um, and overall, I'd say most people are extremely happy with um, whatever IUD they pick. All right, um, moving on to barrier methods. And these um, I'm, I'm putting in here to be complete with the birth control discussion, but um, these two things are generally really not um, seen much within the framework of halacha. Again, like Nahama said, there are definitely, if one of these would be the only option due to whatever reason or situation, like it's worth the ask. Um, so um, one would be um, a condom. This is something that goes over the man's penis um, for each act of intercourse and it collects the ejaculate where the sperm is in um, and then it is taken off afterwards uh, and needs to be like a new one needs to be used um, for every time and then tubal ligation this is a surgical procedure where the fallopian tubes are transected or cut or tied so that where the um, the ovaries where the eggs pop out of during ovulation that egg gets sweeped up into the fallopian tubes it now can there's a blockage and it cannot get into to the, um, it cannot meet the sperm and get fertilized. Um, again, this is, uh, this one is considered permanent sterilization, just like um, a man getting a vasectomy, which is kind of a similar situation, just blocking the ability for sperm to come out. Um, and again, these are very rarely would they be successfully reversed. Um, and it is something that, um, I'd say generally within, again, in the framework of halacha, usually not done, but again, there are always rare exceptions to that rule. I don't know, Hama, if you want to agree with that or whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So let's move on to category number two. So these are progesterone only birth controls. And what overall, um, and this is something I could say about every option for in the progesterone only category, is that progesterone alone, um, one of the advantages to this is that it lessens bleeding. So progesterone, like a constant exposure to progesterone or the uterine lining, thins the lining of the uterus so that there's less bleeding overall. So many people will use these not only for a birth control, but also as a treatment for very heavy periods. Um, we can also use progesterone, um, not even for birth control, but just as a way if someone's having constant spotting and staining as a way to stop that bleeding, right? Because that's one of the actions that progesterone does. Now, progesterone also is safe for almost everyone. I would say the only time I would not give someone progesterone is if they had like a progesterone receptor positive breast cancer. Um, but otherwise, um, if someone has high blood pressure, if someone has had blood clots, um, so many other uh, different um, uh, medical situations, migraines with aura, um, autoimmune diseases that put you more prone to blood clots, all of those situations, um, progesterone is still very safe. Um, so I think a lot of times people lump hormones into this, oh, hormones are not safe, this kind of like mantra that, that is out there, um, but progesterone is actually really safe. Um, so that we should all keep in mind when we kind of go into all these options. All right, so the first thing you may have heard about is the progesterone pill, um, in which there is um, there are two kind of categories of these. So the first one, which is the picture on top, the purple and pink norethendrone, this is what we typically hear about as being referred to as the mini pill. Now, there's nothing more mini about it than any other pill. It's typically the same size. It's called the mini pill because it's only progesterone and not progesterone and estrogen. And this is something that many people who are nursing may be on. Um, the reason for that is um, when you are nursing um, and you need some form of contraception, estrogen can decrease milk supply. So it's not dangerous for you, it's not dangerous for the baby, but it is something that if your milk is important to you, like if you're not at the point where you wanna wean, um, or if you're having supply issues with your milk, um, you want to stay in something progesterone only. Now, the mini pill has 
28 pills in it, all of them are progesterone. There's no break. There's no placebo week. If you're going to get your period on your own cycle, you're going to get your period. There's no control of what your cycle is. You may be taking it when you're nursing and not get much of a period and you aren't getting your period on it, right? It's just the same pill every day. You may get your period back and it just comes back on its own. But if you're taking the mini pill every day at the same time every day, which is important with progesterone only, um, then it should be effective for contraception. And we can see now that we're in the hormonal categories, we see the effectiveness increase, right? So these are about 91% effective. The second, um, um, little picture down here is a newer birth control called SLEND. Now there's the top little pill is missing from this picture, but you can see that there's two colors in it. So the first 24 pills are hormone pills, they're active, and the last four is basically your placebo week or your four days of it. And what that means is that there is a scheduled break in the exposure to progesterone that allows for a withdrawal bleed. Whenever we stop progesterone, there's going to be a withdrawal from it and your uterus kind of sheds that lining that was kind of stabilized by that progesterone. And um, this is great for someone who has constant spotting and staining on a pill like the one above it, right? Where it's every single day, there's never a break. This hormone, it's a different type of progesterone. It's a high dose of it every day. And it, it's okay to take that break as opposed to if you took a four day break on the one above it, it may not be effective for contraception. So this is a different hormone. It's still progesterone dose differently with a scheduled break to help schedule a withdrawal bleed helpful for people who get lots of spotting on the other pill. Okay, that was a lot. Um, all right, next. So now we go into the, um, the other IUDs. So these are called progesterone IUDs. The progesterone in them is called levonorgestrel, so a big long word. Um, and every IUD that has progesterone in it has this hormone in it. There are four different types, and they differ mostly by dose and how um, how long you can use them for. So the first one, this one here in the little pink uterus um, is a model of what's called the Mirena. So the Mirena is an IUD that lasts technically for contraception for seven years. That's what it says on their website. That's what um, other countries use it for. In America, we're using it now for six years. I'm sure within the next couple of years, we will be using it for seven years. Um, it is also the only IUD out there that is specifically FDA approved to be used as a treatment for heavy bleeding. And they say like on their, their little insert that it is used for five years. So this is really great for someone who wants nice long-term contraception. Um, and again, you can use any of these less than the amount of years they're effective for, like in between kids for a couple of years if you'd like. Um, but it's also really nice for someone who's like, you know what, I think I'm done having kids. I'm not 100% sure. Like, you know, you want to keep that good fertility, like fertility around, but I think I'm done. So you put it in and you can get like step six, seven years out of it. And then if you're not yet in menopause, put another one in. And it also kind of gives a nice, because it treats heavy bleeding, it gives a really nice transition into like a time like in your late 40s when you may have heavier bleeding issues around perimenopause and this helps avoid that or can treat it. Um, so again, these IUDs are all about 99.2% effective. There is another IUD exactly like the Mirena, same dose, same time frame. Um, same hormone called Lolita. Um, it is inserted, the insertion device is slightly different. It's, it really acts the same. Um, so your, your one doctor may have one in their office, the other doctor may have a different one in their office. They're exactly the same as far as effectiveness um, and how you react to it. Then there's um, a drop down in dose. So this next IUD here in the little purple circle, it's called Kylina. It, um, sorry, there's a mistake here. It lasts for, um, for, oh yeah, it lasts for five years, sorry. Um, and it's a slightly lower dose. So you are actually more likely to still maintain your period, even though it should be lighter. Whereas with the higher dose one, the Mirena and the Lolita, you may actually lose your period. And you're not losing your cycle, you're just losing your period. You still cycle on your own, um, at least a majority of the time with anything progesterone only. You still may be ovulating, you still may feel kind of moody, PMSy around when period time comes, but then you may not bleed because that progesterone thins the lining of your uterus so much that 
there's just no flow, even though you're at your period time. But with the low, as we keep dropping down the doses of the IUDs, that that um, preventing bleeding effectiveness kind of drops also. So you're more likely to get a light period. It is about 20% smaller in diameter, so sometimes a little easier to go in. And then the Skyla lasts for three years. So that's just another one. It's a touch drop lower in dose. Um, st all still effective um, in the same percentage for contraception. And the Skyla lasts for three years. And again, is even a drop smaller in diameter than the Kylina. These actually, Kylina and Skyla, um, I sometimes often use for um, women or even teenage girls who are having like a lot of problems with really heavy periods. Um, so this is a, you know, it's small enough. It's actually kind of a nice um, treatment for that, even though they may not even need contraception at all. So we can also think of these IUDs as treatments for long-term um, heavy bleeding. Can we discuss for just a moment the uh, timing for placement of an IUD? Yes. <clears throat> uh, from my understanding, typically doctors want to place an IUD during the period when the cervix is really soft. From a halachic standpoint, it is much simpler to get a woman clean because the IUD does usually come with a nice amount of spotting and staining in the beginning. Ideally, from a halachic standpoint, if the IUD is placed after the woman gets to the mikvah, it becomes much easier because then we can use all of the, you know, the categories we talked about of spotting to make the lady stay out of Nida, Nida as opposed to if we get the IUD before we got to the mikvah, then we have to deal with getting clean while we're spotting and it's really, really difficult. So what is your thoughts on um, waiting until after going to the mikvah to have the IUD placed and should a woman, you know, kind of push back a little bit with her doctor if that's something that the doctor doesn't want to be doing? Yeah, so um, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I, I'd say ideally, like if someone's not Jewish or not practicing Tarsa Mishpacha and like their timing, they don't care, but you know, they're asking me, hey, when do you want to put it in? I do like putting it in like very soon after the period or like the last couple of days of the period. And that's because most of the bleeding is done, right? That lining has thinned enough. And um, I know that this uterus is kind of there, the cervix itself is still kind of soft. It should be easy to put in. However, one of the main side effects of the IUD is that you can get a insertion just from like the tissue trauma. And it's, it's really not a lot, like it's still a gentle insertion but of it going through the cervix into the uterus. So you can get some spotting from that. Um, and one of the initial effects of progesterone can be to slough off and kind of get rid of the lining that is still there. So that's why I like doing it at the very end of a period because there's not much there left. So that kind of minimizes the spotting that will happen. But also you don't want to do it right before a period either because that lining is nice and thick and you're going to have like that spotting is going to be a lot more prolonged and it's going to take you a lot longer to get to the mikvah. So when someone is practicing Tarsa Meshvacha and they are planning to go to the mikvah, finish the period on your own, get your seven clean days because if we start, if we put the IUD in, like those seven days are going to be really, really difficult to get through, um, especially just even from insertional spotting, like that tissue trauma. Um, and then go to the mikvah, have an course for a day or two, and then get it put in as close to mikvah as you can, as opposed to as close to the upcoming period, which is going to happen in two weeks as you can. Because remember, that lining is growing and growing and growing throughout those two weeks to give you your next period. And we want to kind of get that IUD in kind of before it starts to build up really thick. We can actually put IUDs in anytime. There's no like um, physical barrier to being able to put it in at a different time of your cycle. Sometimes they're just easier than others. We also like to make sure you're not pregnant too. So that's um, that's one little caveat of putting it in after going to the mikvah is um, Either you are transitioning from a different contraception and you still have, you're still taking that. So we know you're not pregnant. Um, your doctor will likely want to do a pregnancy test, but there is that risk of if you didn't use birth control and you went to the mikvah and you know you were ovulating, and then we put an IUD in that if a pregnancy had fertilized, 
it may not stick because we just put an IUD in. So that's why we like to do pregnancy tests. So we don't, we're careful about not putting an IUD in someone who we know for sure isn't pregnant. And that's one of the thoughts behind putting it in when someone has their period or just finished it before ovulation. So just kind of something to think about, um, you know, if you go to the mikva and are using this as your first birth control and you haven't used anything the couple of days beforehand. And if you had already gone to the mikvah and you have that insertional bleeding, then it would be considered spotting in that first category we talked about, which is that right. we can attribute the spotting to something else. We call it a dam maka, that it would be from the procedure that causes the spotting. And then we would not be a nida from, that was just asked in the chat, then we would not be a nida from that insertion of the IUD. Um, right. So all in all, from a halachic standpoint, maybe not from the doctor's office standpoint, it's yeah. much easier if you go after the mikvah and just use some right. other form of birth control until you get to the IUD. Right. And there is a little device that we actually put onto the cervix to hold onto the cervix to be able to have traction to kind of put the IUD in. And that can definitely cause some bleeding. So there's, it's not even, it's it's like a real maca, like it's it's there, right? So, um, and, and we see it. Um, okay. Let's move on to the next one. So this is something called Nexplanon. This is, um, it is a little um, plastic rod and you can kind of see the size frame there. And it gets inserted on the inside of the arm under the skin, um, right kind of over your tricep muscle. Um, it is, um, it has a progesterone in it called etonogestrel. Um, it lasts for three years. It's about 99.9% .9 effective. Um, if one caveat I would give for that, if you are on any medications that are for anti-convulsants, like anti-seizure, um, it may decrease the effectiveness of it. Um, and sometimes you may be on these for like migraine prevention or mood control. So um, not only just to prevent seizures. So um, just kind of think about your medication list when you're thinking about this. Um, but it is, um, it's great for people who you know, feel kind of weird about um, having something in them, like an IUD, like, you know, in their uterus, or someone who's like not really good at taking a pill every day. And, you know, you want long-term effective birth control that's going to be reliable for you. Um, I think these are great for some people. Um, I do see a little bit more spotting on them in the beginning. Um, so I think it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but I actually think we can minimize spotting a little better with an IUD, even though that's something that's like in your, you know, your uterus and can cause some spotting like through the vagina. Um, I still see some spotting on this. So, um, you know, that that's, can be frustrating and kind of long-term, I'd say in the first like six months. So this is, I'd say definitely not a really popular option for many from women, but I'll tell you, there are people who love it. You know, so I, I don't I don't want to like discourage anyone, um, but just to kind of know like what you'd be in for um, if choosing this. And so it's important. Again, um, I probably would do similar time frame, um, right? Like it's not causing, it wouldn't be causing any maca, it wouldn't be causing any you know issues with the cervix or the uterus, right? Because it's going in your arm. Um, but just in, in case some spotting starts right after, it may be a good idea to get this one put in as well um, soon after mikvah. All right. Um, and a little bit of um, local anesthetic is given, just kind of like going to the dentist, right? The lidocaine, novocaine, um, it gets put in um, in the skin of the arm and then this little rod just gets injected. The whole thing takes like three minutes to do, maybe less. All right, this one, um, I'll be honest, I hate it, um, but I'm being complete. Um, Zappa Provera, it is a, a progesterone injection that gets injected about every 12 weeks. Um, it is um, something that, um, it's not great for child spacing because there can be a really slow return to fertility. So some people can get pregnant like you know, three months later after their last dose, because that's the um, kind of time frame of the dosing. But sometimes it can take about a year and a half for your fertility to come back. It's also, it's a medication that's injected into your, you know, like muscle. I, I can't really take it out if you don't like it, right? Like an IUD, you don't like it, I take it out. Next one on, you take it out. A pill you stop taking. Um, but this is in you. Like it's it's harder to control and it's harder to deal with some of the side effects. Um, this is the one birth control that is has statistically significant weight gain from it. So I'd say about 50% of people do gain between 10 and 20 pounds. Um, 
when they're on it, which again, usually is not desired, especially postpartum. Um, so um, again, all the other birth controls, even though some people do notice some weight gain on it, in studies, this is the one that was shown to be like quite significant as far as weight gain goes. It is very effective though. Um, so just kind of like the IUDs, um, you just have to remember to come back every three months and get it in. Um, again, I don't love it. It can cause a lot of spotting in those first three months. Um, some people end up with no periods on it as well. Um, so some people who are who love it, love it, but it's definitely not my favorite. Okay. Um, all right. So let's um, jump into the third category. So we're almost there. I don't even know what time it is. Okay. Um, all right. We're getting we're getting close to that hour. So combination um, hormonal um, methods. These are a combination of estrogen and progesterone. What does that do? That prevents ovulation. So that is how it is working for birth control. Um, and I did forget to mention how is progesterone only working for birth control? It thickens the cervical mucus, so sperm can't really get in there. It thins the lining of the uterus. It prevents the tubes from like moving well to bring that egg to where it's supposed to be. But this type works for preventing ovulation. It's super easy to manipulate your cycle. It gives you a predictable cycle. And th these are like the benefits of um of the combination forms. There are three different types. One is the pill, which most people know about, comes in lots and lots and lots of different forms. You have to take it every single day. So that has to be an important ability of yours to remember to take it every day. If you skip around here and there, you will get lots of spotting You will, and you will not have effective birth control. Um, it, um, it improves menstrual symptoms. Most periods usually get a little bit lighter, less cramps, it can be shorter. Um, and the, the way it's formulated in a pill pack is like a monthly natural cycle, right? Three weeks, no bleeding, one week of bleeding where you get three weeks of hormone pills and one week of um, placebo pills, which have nothing in them. Some pills have a little bit of iron in them at the placebo week when you're getting your period, but that's where you withdraw, right? You withdraw from the hormone. You've stopped taking it. Usually about two days in, you start the bleed. And then when you start your next pack, you the period stops. Um, there are, um, of all the pills, there are usually about one type of estrogen um, and they differ in dose. There are lots of different types of progesterones that also differ in dose. So that's why there's like so many different pills that all have like different little um, nuances to them as far as what progesterone they use, what dose of estrogen and what dose of that progesterone. And um, you know, that's where, when we start talking about side effects, that's where it's really important to know what pill you're on. You can't just say, I'm on the pill. What pill are you on? Because what if that doesn't work for you and another one works great for you? Why? Because they differ. There's different medication in there. There's different dosing in there. And some progesterones will have some side effects and some will have others. And so what is uncomfortable for you? What's going on with you? What are your priorities? Let's pick a progesterone that's not gonna bother you with what you were bothered with before, right? So that's why it's so nuanced. And um, picking the pill, um, usually when a doctor puts you on the pill, they'll, say, they'll pick one that they know that most of their patients love because there's usually less side effects. So those are, um, those are kind of considerations to have and kind of definitely conversation with your doctor. Now, the other ways of getting this com combination is just a different delivery system. So again, we're still talking about the same estrogen and progesterone in there. Um, so this is what vaginal rings are a, a second way of getting that in you. And these are rings that go inside the vagina and they stay there for three weeks. So instead of having to take a pill every single day for three weeks, like on a pill pack, it's in you for three weeks, you're getting the medication, it's absorbed through the vaginal walls and you don't have to remember something every day. Then three weeks later, you take it out and then you withdraw and then you get your period. There is, um, there's two types. One is called the nuvering, which are these two pictures here. The blue one is actually clear here in this picture. Um, this is just the sample. Um, it's super thin, super flexible. You do not feel it when it's in you. Um, it sits in your vagina. It's kind of where a tampon would be. So you don't need to, um, you know, you're able to put it in and out yourself. You can keep it in during intercourse. Um, if it's uncomfortable for either of you, then you can take it out for a couple hours at a time. You just need to remember to put it back in. Um, it can also come out for the mikvah. I mean, you're in the mikvah for, you know, not very long. Um, 
So um, it can be out for that length of time if it is considered something, this is a, a question you would ask, if it's considered something that needs to be removed from your body before going in. There's a newer one called Anovera. This is, um, as opposed to the new ring, which you need to, there's a new ring every month. This is one ring that you keep for the whole year. It lasts for 13 cycles and you keep it in for three weeks and out for a week. And then you just rinse it off and put it in this little case. And then a week later, you put it back in. Um, it is only about two millimeters bigger in diameter, but it is a little bit thicker just to hold that extra um, that extra bit of hormone to last for the full year instead of one month. Um, and they're pretty like effect, just as effective as the birth control pill. Um, and then there's the patches, um, Zulane and Torla. Um, there are two different types. You change them every week. So the pack kind of comes with three, the three patches. Um, and every week, um, it just, the hormone gets absorbed through your skin. There is a weight limit on these. So generally a BMI under 30, it's appropriate for. Um, Zulane specifically says um, under 198 pounds. It's kind of random to me, but that, that's kind of what it says in their studies. And these are also very effective. The, this may bring up some issues at the mikvah as well, um, because it is a sticker on you. Um, if you are, if you go to the mikvah when you're just put on a new patch like the day or two before, you can't take it off and stick it back on because it may not stick well and you may not get um, that absorption through your skin as well when you place it back on. So you would have to put a new patch on. So you'd have to kind of have some extra patches around. Um, so that's just kind of like a, a mikvah question as well. Um, all right, and, and just um, the one comment on progesterone estrogen combined methods. How does it work for cycle manipulation? We can add a few extra days onto the hormonal exposure, or we can take a couple away. Um, so we can kind of decide what day you're going to have that withdrawal bleed by adding some pills. Um, we can skip the period entirely. We can say, don't take the placebo pills, go straight into your next pack or go straight into your next ring. Um, and that kind of avoids a period. And that is nice for wedding planning. It's nice for vacation planning. Um, and it's nice for people who may have like long periods and they just want to kind of, you know, extend that cycle a little bit longer before they go to the mikvah again. So these are all kind of things we're able to do. It doesn't always work perfectly for everyone. Um, it takes a lot of trial and error, um, but that is possible with these forms. Um, and again, just side effects. Um, I kind of lumped them all into one slide because they're all pretty similar. So the bleeding irregularities, and this is what Nahama was talking about before, whenever starting a new hormone, there can always, always be spotting and staining. Um, and as far as if it puts you into mikvah or, or into nita or not, that is definitely something to ask. Um, and it can be dependent on your dose as well. So sometimes we will increase someone's estrogen dose or progesterone dose because they're getting spotting on something low dose. Um, so that's why it's, again, it's important to know from your doctor what what are you taking and does it work for you? And how does it not work for you? Um, other changes from all hormones, mood changes, headaches, acne flare, decreased libido, vaginal dryness, bloating. And again, what, what side effects are you specifically having from the birth control that you're on? And so uh, from this list, and how can we keep you on a method that works within your lifestyle, but kind of is a little different that helps decrease the side effect that you're upset by. Um, so that's kind of, that's a big conversation point with your doctor because there are so many options. And remember, there's like, not all pills and people are the same, right? What works for your sisters may not work for you. What works for your mom may not work for you. What works for your friend may not work for you because you're very individual. And um, just remember like, be on top of what you are taking, what side effects you're having from it so that we can- are the same. Exactly, right? It applies everywhere, headers. across the board. We don't board. share, we don't share headers. Right, Every exactly. Right. right. Um, all right, was there something you wanted to say now? Yeah, I just want to close yeah. with one more thing before we get to some questions. Yeah. Um, the last area of NIDA that contraceptive contraception would um, <clears throat> affect, different contraceptives would affect, um, according to many rabbis, if you are on a contraceptive, then your calculating of your vestote or your own a days is different. Okay. So according to many rabbis, once you have a chazaka, which means three times proven that a certain contraceptive overrides your cycle, then your veset or your ona would only be calculated according to that override of the cycle. For example, if a woman is on a birth control pill and for three months in a row, she establishes that she only gets her period 
two days after she stops her active pill, then her new VESET would be the ONA two days after she stops her active pill, which means she no longer has to keep the three ONA days that we would usually calculate. Let's say I finish my pill on day 28, 48 hours after three times in a row, I get my period. Then that means whenever that ONA is, if that's gonna be the nighttime, if 48 hours after I finish my night pill is gonna be the nighttime, then I would separate from my husband for that night ONA I would do a badika afterwards, and then I again am free to be back together with my husband. So once we establish that no longer is, you know, the regular calculations what determines our period, but we are interfering with our cycle in some hormonal or chemical way, then when we establish that that is overriding our cycle, that can affect our VESET calculations. Now, it's a good idea that because we are so careful about NIDA and we don't want to play with fire that, you know, for the 24 hours before we expect this period, it's not a good idea to be intimate with your husband because not every pill is an exact science that when it's 48 hours, it's always going to be 48 hours, but it's just a very good idea for somebody to ask a Shiloh if, you know, if their rub does hold by this, because many rabbis do, that you no longer are subject to the regular three VESET days once you are doing something to interrupt or interfere with that regular cycle, because those VESET days might may no longer apply to your new situation. Exactly. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and then there's also the issue of like, what if you take it continuously, right? And you don't bleed at all, like, does that all go away, right? Like the um, the calculation. So that's definitely your need a calendar is affected by the manipulation and the effects of the hormones for sure. Exactly. Um, all right. So my last two slides. Oh. Yeah. We have a couple of questions. I don't know how many yes. we have time for, so we'll go through just a few of them and then let me just finish. Let me just finish the last oh, two slides. So sorry, and then and then we'll get to that. I have I have my last one, QA. I know. Uh, it's my it's my cue to myself. Um okay. The the and these honestly, I have to say, I feel like these are probably the two most important slides because whatever method you pick, you have to think about this. And this is something I talk about with my own patients, both in the office and in telemedicine. And sometimes it just Aside from like the medical part of it, like this brings so much clarity to the discussion for, and the decision for you. So, so what's your priority? Like, ask yourself your question: What's your priority? Do you need like the most effective contraception? Do you need? Are you having lots of bleeding issues, and you need to be able to control that really well? Do you want to control your cycle? Like, do you want to be able to do that manipulation? So that kind of the ordering of that kind of lets us know what to kind of pick from because not everything is going to be perfect for all three of these kind of priorities, right? Like you need to decide what, where are you willing to like work on, but what are you not willing to kind of compromise on? So that's really helpful for yourself to think about when you're choosing. And then two take-home points. One, again, totally individual decision. Um, what you want for your contraceptive choice and your family planning decisions is not someone else's. Um, and again, you have a different body than everyone else in the world. So you may react differently than um, other people who are on it. So um, it's to say, oh, my sister didn't like this. My friend did like this. That means I won't or I will. It has no bearing on what experience you may have. Um, and then trial and error is super duper important. And if anyone follows me on Instagram, that was my reel today. Um, I planned it. Um, trial and error is, is, you know, it's, it's lucky when we pick one, the first thing and you love it and love it and you want to stay on it, you know, as long as you need contraception. That's lucky. Um, There's so many different types of birth control and different hormones out there and they all affect us and all the methods um, that sometimes you just have to like commit, like mentally commit to keep trying until you find out what works best for you. Um, and then a little bit of that frustration, if something doesn't work out, you're kind of, you've already committed to that, right? You kind of are like, okay, I'm going to move on, you know, instead of getting super upset and saying, hey, this doesn't work for me across the board. I'm never trying again. Um, so just kind of like, just kind of like a mind framing attitude to have. Um, and then just thank you, Neely, for having me. This was great. Um, I love talking about this. As you can tell, this is like what I do all day. Um, if you want to find me, um, here's my email number, um, website, and social media. Um, and it's not hard to find me. I'm kind of out there. Um, 
and would be totally happy to see any one of you, especially if you're in Illinois. I am able to prescribe um, in Illinois as well, um, if anyone needs a prescription um, and a consultation. Um, and that's it. Um, so now here's my question and answer slide. <laughs> So okay, we can so get right to those. Questions we'll get to as many as we can. Okay. Uh, we are not going to answer any personal individual questions, but more just general questions. Um, okay, so here we go. The first question is, um, what's the difference in side effects between hormonal and non-hormonal IUDs? Is the staining usually less than a flow? Yeah, so um, as far as the non-hormonal, the copper one, remember one of the side effects was longer, heavier periods as opposed to the progesterone IUDs, which is almost like the exact opposite where it lightens periods, but in the beginning can still have a little bit of unpredictable spotting. You can actually get some spotting with the copper IUD as well, just from like insertional bleeding too, um, and just irritation of that lining, which is how it's working. Um, but that's that's really the main the main side effect of the copper IUD. Um, as far as flow, um, it's going to be heavier with the copper and potentially lighter with the um, the progesterone ones that may not be considered a flow with the progesterone ones. And that's obviously a Shiloh that would have to be asked. Right. And what yeah. would you say in terms of um, taking some type of progesterone or something to minimize bleeding at the beginning of an IUD? Is that uh, something that you would recommend? Yeah, I think that's great. And and if we if you can like plan it, and I'll tell you probably most gynecologists who are not so familiar with this may be like, what do you need to do that for? Like the spotting is normal. But when you transition from one form of like hormonal birth control to an IUD, it's always better to, to have a bridge and kind of double them up, like stay on your old method, like a pill or a ring, and then leave it in for like two or three weeks once the IUD is already in, because that extra little hormonal exposure can help decrease the spotting that you may have from the, um, the IUD itself. And that's actually how we fix some spotting too. So if you get your IUD in randomly, like let's say postpartum, um, you, we, we can, you have prolonged spotting, we can give like a month of a pill pack or some progesterone pills as well to help stop that spotting. So it's also used as a treatment when it's starting to become frustrating. Okay. Um, in terms of double packing or triple packing, how much is healthy? How much would be unhealthy to kind of... Yeah. No yeah. So you're referring to using it in continuous method, which means um, skipping the placebo pills or the placebo week and going straight into the next um, hormone. So you're just taking hormones kind of like indefinitely um, as long as you want is the answer. Um, there's no physiologic reason that you have to get a period. It's not building up in you. It's not bad. It's not too much hormones. It's just if, if you don't get spotting and if you do get spotting while you're trying to go three months, four months, five months, that's your body's sign. Nope, that lining is becoming unstable. It's starting to come out. Give yourself that period, that five to seven day break. Give it to yourself. But if you don't get it, you can go as long as you want. So it's not, it's totally safe to do that. Okay. Um, why would it not be a problem to, so this is a halakha question, why would it not be a problem to insert the IUD if you're inserting it into the uterus? Um, and the reason that would not be a halakhic problem or a nida issue is because a certain size instrument needs to enter the uterus in order for it to become problematic from a nida standpoint of something entering the uterus. The insertion of the IUD, as far as I understand, Dr. Hellman, you can confirm this, is not wide enough or large enough to create the issue of a nida issue. So it would not create an issue of um, something entering the uterus that a certain size would create. And because the bleeding is from the, the maca or from the trauma caused, then it would not be considered nida bleeding. Right. And the, the Mirena insertion device is 3.8 millimeters. Um, I've heard some numbers for like halachic, I guess, um, cutoffs being four millimeters. There are some, some Rebbeim who say anything that goes in does, you know, does put you in tina. So it's, I think it's, it's, um, kind of dependent on who you're asking, um, as far as, you know, what sect of Judaism you are Always in. Always the question of your Yes, exactly. Rabbi. Right. Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, does progesterone only contraception um, have less mood side effects? 
Um, not necessarily. Um, a lot of the mood effects that people have from birth control, like pills, is actually due to the progesterone. So, um, you know, you can get mood changes from either one. That's why dosing is important. You may feel moody on one dose, but then if we drop the dose down a little bit, still maintaining its contraceptive effectiveness, um, you may feel better on it. Um, so progesterone only is not always a mood solution. Um, but again, why is it different than estrogen and progesterone? Because we're, you know, what if you, some of your mood changes are due to the estrogen? At least that's not in the picture. Um, so there's lots of things we can kind of try and play around with if that's a concern. So connected to that, somebody else asks if there's mental health issues like depression, is that something they should stay away from? Um, maybe, and maybe not. So um, if you do get um, very moody, especially around your period, like it's PMS or PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, um, <clears throat> where people get extremely depressed, um, birth control pills may actually help that because it takes away that natural cycling and some people will take it continuously to avoid that phase in their cycle, to avoid that huge drop in mood related to the horm the natural hormonal drop that you get in your cycle and become moody. Um, so it can help, but if you find yourself kind of moody throughout the whole month that you've started something new and there's like a really big change that you've noticed, then yes, it, it may be that. Um, it, and then it's worth kind of change, thinking about what can I change here? Can I change the dose? Can I change the type of progesterone? Should I change methods completely? Should I try non-hormonal? So those are all the questions to ask and important to kind of talk with like a way to figure it out with your doctor. Okay. And then how does someone determine if they're menopausal, if they're on a birth control? So that's a great question. Um, one is, um, and A, it, if you do not um, develop any conditions um, throughout your um, later reproductive years that would um, prevent the ability to use um, estrogen-containing birth control, you really can be on a birth control pill until your early 50s. That is fine. There's no age cutoff unless you have a condition that would um, determine that. Um, and um, if you kind of stop bleeding on your placebo week, right, because your body is just not, that withdrawal bleed doesn't happen because hormonally you're not responding to it, that's one sign that you may be in menopause because you are not responding to that withdrawal bleed. Um, and sometimes um, the only way to know is to get off of it and see, and or do a blood test called FSH, which um, gives us an idea of where you may be in that and that we cannot do when you're on birth control. It's just not accurate. Um, so that is something that could be done to see. And look, if you're like 51, 52, the chances of you getting pregnant in that month are extremely low. Um, or if you want to use like a quick method, like a spermicide or something um, in that month that you're trying to see like, hey, is my period going to come back? Um, those are all kind of ways to help yourself figure it out. Okay. Um, let me just see what other questions there are. If someone has a hard time wearing tampons, will the nuva ring bother them? Um, so it's a very, yeah. You use the vaginal ring or patch to skip period. So both in the same question. Okay. Yeah. So as far as the nuva ring, it is a very different material than a tampon. Um, Remember, you're also like, have your period during your tampon. You may feel just a little bit more uncomfortable overall in the pelvic area. Um, and it really does kind of sit in the whole vagina. The ring itself, super flexible and actually kind of like sits up at the top of the vagina um, or at the top vaginal wall. Um, I think the issue is more putting it in and out. Like, do you feel comfortable with that? Um, but likely the Nuva ring will not bother you because it's a different material and a different shape. And it's super thin and flexible as opposed to a tampon that does it is not as flexible, right? It's a little bit more of a solid cotton, you know, swab. Um, <clears throat> and then if you do use the vaginal ring and the patch, can you use it to skip periods? Most definitely, you just don't take the break. Um, so the patch, it's three weeks of the patch or three three weekly patches and then a week off. The, the ring is in for three weeks, out for a week. You would just put a new ring in right away. Like when you, you know, after taking out the old one, you would just put a new patch on right away instead of taking that break. Um, so you can um, definitely manipulate it in the same way um, as you would with the pill pack. Wonderful. Okay. I think that pretty much does it for the time that we have. Thank you so much, Dr. Hellman. You are phenomenal. This oh, thank you for having me. This is great. This is great.
Um, if you have any questions and you'd like to reach out to Dr. Hellman, you have her contact information, how to do that. If you have any halacha questions, feel free to reach out to the Neely hotline. Again, it's an anonymous hotline that you can call, text, email, or submit a web form. Um, and we are happy to contact your local rabbi in Chicago. Um, and, or feel free to reach out to your local rabbi, Robinson or Kala teacher. Um, thank you all for joining and have a great night. All right. Bye. Thanks, everyone.